So lately, I've been reading some of the writings of Henry Kissinger, the former U.S. Secretary of State and uh, National Security Advisor under Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. However, um, I find Henry Kissinger, you know, like one of those really complicated figures. And I wanted to ask somebody the question, what is he all about? Like, what are the ambitions for his motivations? Because we really have to recognize that a lot of people in the mainstream still view Henry Kissinger as one of the largest champions of world peace in the world by the mainstream. I mean, people on CNN, I mean, people like David Petraeus, people who are just very, very mainstream are saying that Henry Kissinger is one of the largest champions of peace and order in the world. And then on the other hand, like in the more sort of internet and social circles, everyone's just like, he's a war criminal. He's a war criminal. You know, he um, said the very famous line, the illegal we do immediately, the unconstitutional takes a little bit longer. He was responsible for the destabilization of Chile and, you know, toppling Salvador Allende so that um, they could institute the Pinochet regime, a horrible, torturous regime on the Chilean people because they didn't want to deal with the democratic process. They're just like, the democratic process is too slow, so then people like Henry Kissinger do certain actions to try and get a particular desired outcome. This is also very evident from other things, like say, for example, what was going on in Southeast Asia, as well as abandoning people in Iraq and leaving them to die. Um, it's like, a lot of blood is on the hands of Henry Kissinger, and as well as other things such as, you know, just manipul manipulating the diplomatic affairs of President Lopez Portillo in Mexico. So it's like he's controlling so many things all around the world. But what really is he all about? I'm always reminded of, you know, Mr. Ollivander in the Harry Potter series when he's just like, you know who did great things, terrible, terrible, but great things. And when I was uh, watching the movie Kissinger and Nixon, which is based on the Walter Isaacson biography, it is, um, it's really just sort of came across like that. Nixon says that Kissinger is the smartest person who ever lived. And, you know, Henry Kissinger was one of the greatest thinkers of our time, he is one of the greatest thinkers of our time. I mean, still kicking as we speak, but it's like, he did a lot of terrible things in his life, but, you know, it's just the ability to, um, rise to the level that he did, you know, to not only National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, but his role on the geopolitical influence is just, um, it's, it really represents a sort of very, very powerful intellect. However, at the same time, uh, someone actually made a comment, not about Kissinger, but about Zbigniew Brzezinski, when they were saying that, um, you know, it's like, he's a terrible person, who cares how smart he is? Well, at the same time, you know, it's like there are things that we can learn and a lot of people are studying Kissinger. That's the whole thing. Like, that's the whole point. It's like people are studying Kissinger to see how he functioned, how he operated. And Kissinger has written numerous books. And I was just reading his book, World Order, prior to this recording. And that was one of the major motivations to record something about Henry Kissinger. But, um... One of the things that we need to recognize is that he is leaving an influence. Mark Zuckerberg actually was a very large champion of the book World Order, and it really covers a lot of things because what he's actually sort of doing is combining the concepts of peace and order. I was having a conversation with someone recently on the internet, of course, because I don't socialize much face to face, and they were just like, peace is often contrary to order. I only want order for societies. And it's like, why wouldn't you want order versus peace or vice versa? Well, Henry Kissinger thinks that it's possible. He wants just, just to be based on the uh, Peace of Westphalia, the Treaty of Westphalia 1648, which en ended the Thirty Years' War. And this book, World Order, is like, you know, it has a lot of fascinating material in it. And I'm sort of aware that um, it's written by somebody who is a control maniac, like who is a war criminal and who also wanted to manipulate the geopolitical context to get a desired outcome. But the interesting things that we encounter in the book World Order relate to sort of some very specific ideas. Kissinger seems to be all about peaceful coexistence in the book. What he talks about is like when you don't have a multi-party democracy, when you don't have 
you know, things like religious freedom and when you don't have, you know, this urge to conquer them. Well, okay, let's, let's present it in a simpler fashion. He says that there are three things that slow down a country's growth. A single party or authoritarian rule, a single religious orthodoxy, and imperialism in multiple directions. That's perhaps a clearer way of presenting it, and it's more true to what he was writing about. So, I mean, that just sort of goes to show you that peaceful coexistence is the only possible way. And he talks about this with Europe a lot. Like, for example, there are many European nations from many different backgrounds, even as far as different religions, especially if you're going to incorporate something like Turkey involved. And, of course, you know, different cultural things going on with the Balkans versus the Iberian Peninsula. Well, it's like the way you achieve something like that is just recognizing that people are going to be different within their own, you know, nation, within their own territory, but on the outside they're just going to get rid of the military conflicts that drive them apart. They are just going to have what is called world order. And the only way to do that is peaceful coexistence. And the other ways to, to reduce that is like, the ways to reduce the problems are we need to a massive reduction in the need for imperialism in multiple directions, for one nation to just be exerting its influence in a massive way, because that's going to cause destruction. And furthermore, just trying to sort of present a single religious orthodoxy for everyone, well, that's all about peaceful coexistence. I mean, just recognizing our differences and trying to get along, or at the very least, one geographic area is able to exist next to another geographic area without immediate war based on differences. So it's just very nice to hear some of these things that are associated with um, the theory of how the world could achieve a more peaceful manner. But, um, you know, Henry Kissinger is someone whom people don't really take an enormous liking to because, well... Seymour Hirsch wrote a book about him in the 1980s, Kissinger in the Nixon White House, where were, the, the real name is The Price of Power, Kissinger in the Nixon White House, which he really tried to do sort of a takedown of Henry Kissinger and expose him for being a war criminal. And they kind of revived the effort in about, what was it, 15 years later when Christopher Hitchens put out his book, The Trial of Henry Kissinger. And by Hitch Hitchens' own admissions, uh, mo by Hitchens' own admission, that's turning into a tongue twister there, uh, by Hitchens' own admission, Seymour Hirsch did most of the research for his book, and what really happened was Christopher Hitchens wrote two articles for Harper's Magazine, and um, they gained a lot of notoriety, so they expanded upon that and created the trial of Henry Kissinger, and that was once again trying to point out all of the sort of destructive elements associated with Henry Kissinger's time as Secretary of State. And Hitchens also reminds us that uh, Richard Nixon's first article of impeachment, like the first thing they wanted to impeach Nixon for, had nothing to do with Watergate. It was for the bombing of Cambodia, which um, is not talked about very often. But that is something that is, um, well, well, you know, who was, who, was, who was involved with that? Well, Henry Kissinger, of course. And, you know, they, they were just trying to say that that was something that was done in a very illegal manner. And the Nixon regime is actually, you know, it really depends on which historian you ask. Because I wanted to say that, um, I mean, Hitchens has the other point that the Attorney General, John Mitchell, was the first Attorney General to ever go to prison. But on the other hand, you have historians like Jeff Shepard who also say that, you know, it's just a complete miss representation of what actually happened with Nixon and Watergate, that Nixon was taken out because of democratic sabotage. And basically what um, Shepard is arguing is that um, there are just a lot of misrepresentations out there about the Richard Nixon campaign and the Richard Nixon executive uh, terms in the, as the, in the presidency. But um, when we want to get back to Kissinger, I mean, it's like, Kissinger is someone who is a very brilliant individual. I mean, he did a lot of destructive things, but how did he get to the level of where he was? Well, virtually, I mean, like, he had a lot of influence at Harvard. I believe he spent 20 years at Harvard, and he was discovered there by Nelson Rockefeller, but um, he also was influenced by someone whose name I... Um, his name escapes me. Like, I never really... Can, I can never remember the name of this one guy, but... He was um, kind of the protege of someone who was a large champion of the British system of political economy. But um, 
Anyway, um, Nelson Rockefeller played a large role in the, Henry Kissinger's rise to power. And what you really see is that we really do have the oligarchy. Like, this isn't some drawn-out conspiracy theory, and no, I mean, like, it's just, it's an oligarchy. There are people who have both wealth and power at the same time, and they're allowed to pull other people into their group, such as, I mean, you see this all the time. I mean, like, Kissinger would be a perfect example of it, you know, someone who came over from Germany because of the historical events that were happening there, and then, you know, was in the army, he went to Harvard, and then he was pulled into an elite circle, and as well as many other people, like, Barack Obama, you know, was, like, pulled into many things. Like, he met Zbigniew Brzezinski at Occidental College, and they sort of, you know, conspired together. Furthermore, Hillary Clinton, you know, met Saul Alinsky when she was in high school, wrote a thesis on Saul Alinsky, and all of these people just have connections to the mega elites. Like, when you have someone who cut, who either becomes president or has the chance to rise to the presidency, it doesn't really happen by accident. It does not happen for, you know, just the wave of human emotion. It doesn't happen because of the will of the people in our current day and age. Maybe in the past years, and we can talk about some examples, like such as James Garfield, perhaps. But um, people really rise to these high-ranking positions of power because they get discovered by someone who is already involved in the powerful circles. That's why we have an oligarchy. I mean, like some guy just walking around, you know, holding up a list of, hey, these are some nice ideas that we can try. He doesn't get any attention at all. No, it's someone who can sort of present with ideas in a way that somehow gets noticed by somebody who's in an elite circle, like Nelson Rockefeller notices them, Saul Alinsky, conferences with them, so Bigniew Brzezinski notices them, and then they become, you know, either a protege, or that person invests in them, or that person gets pulled into the elite circle in one way or another. You know, it's like, um, if you are sort of someone who has ideas, those people often go on to just, you know, do something like talk radio at its best, but, you know, it's really not the case with broadcasting. I mean, Tucker Carlson is the heir to the Swanson fortune, as well as he was also the uh, grandnephew of J. William Fulbright, who was the personal mentor to none other than Bill Clinton. These global elite circles are enormous, and they're all, they're all people who are just in, they're in their own little group, and it's, I mean, it really does incorporate a lot of people, but you know, this is just an evolution of the aristocracy. In the past, we had the aristocracy, which was determined by the bloodline. But now we have the global elites who are an oligarchy, where it's just like their select group controls everything. And, you know, Donald Trump even brought Henry Kissinger to the White House. You can see this on YouTube. And he said, Henry Kissinger is a friend of mine. I've known him for years. It's like Trump was a billionaire, right? He is a billionaire, and um, he has connections to the global elites as well. He has always been one of the global elites, so that's just... There are oligarchs that are running the show, and Henry Kissinger got pulled into that system. Do you think that Henry Kissinger would have become president if he had been eligible? I mean, of course, he was born in Germany, not, not a born American citizen. Would he have become president if he had been eligible? I think absolutely. I think there's no doubt about it, Henry Kissinger would have become president if he had uh, become, if he had been eligible. I mean, he just had the ability to rise in the power system. He had the ability to um, calculate and to just sort of do certain things that would predict a particular outcome. Well, you know, there are a lot of people that are opposed to Henry Kissinger outside of, you know, Christopher Hitchens and Seymour Hersh. The Lyndon LaRouche movement is horribly opposed to anything associated with Kissinger. Uh, they're actually the ones who put forward the allegation that Kissinger manipulated the diplomatic relations of President Lopez Portillo. But um, we do have, you know, confirmation that there was a sort of indeed a meeting that happened. But the thing is, they don't have a certain amount of um, credibility but one of the things, though, that, you know, if you do sort of kind of put two and two together, Henry Kissinger said some things to Mike Wallace back in 1958 when he sort of thought that there are nations, you know, like Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, that all of these things just couldn't become independent countries. And then nations like Egypt as well, they needed to be all in just their own separate um, 
federations. He wanted a North African federation of Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. And then he wanted Egypt to be part of a larger Middle Eastern federation. And it doesn't take too much, you know, imagination to see that that would probably be because he wouldn't want the other North Africans to be associated with President Nasser in Egypt. And, um, you know, as a poor, for like linking together with infrastructure projects and as well as sort of sharing communal ideas because they were really trying to contain President Nasser, but, um, or the exact title that he was um, using. But what I would really sort of say about uh, those things is just that a lot of that stuff gets very theoretical when you examine it from that particular angle. I was just very surprised, you know, that someone whom I don't really admire that much, like Henry Kissinger, had this book out, World Order, published in 2014, that just had that very insightful thing where it's like, I mean, he's talking about how a nation, a nation can't survive if it's just saying everyone has to believe the same thing, if everyone ha has to sort of expand outward. It's more just like you have saying that these nations, you know, need to recognize their own sort of individuality, and then they just need to allow people to think freely, to believe freely. But what all human beings have to do is they have to overcome that hurdle. They have to overcome that barrier of, you know, I want to kill somebody because they have a different thought process than I do. And before you're thinking that that's a religious thing, it is not. That can be done with religion. It can be done with philosophy. It can be done with, you know, like any sort of thought process. You know, it's just going to be like this person has you know, a different philosophy than I do because, um, we have so many of these conflicts throughout the ages that happen for a variety of reasons. And well, the point is, no matter what, no matter what, we're talking peaceful coexistence. It is possible. And the way that you sort of get closer and closer to peaceful coexistence is you sort of promote a message to all of humanity that it is impractical to kill somebody just because they're different than you. I mean, just because they are different than you in some way is not, you know, a prerequisite for destruction. That is sort of the thing that has to be kind of instilled. And, like, you also do need to recognize that uh, we sort of can, after World War One, we really had this kind of awakening that um, a leader who wants to go out into the world and conquer different lands for his people, I mean, that sort of kind of mentality has been really changed. A lot of things happen after World War One. Like, even if you look at the um, the work of William Shakespeare or something, so many characters are kings and princes and thus, like, the uh, they are glorified. But um, that part is glorified. But now, you know, it's like, even by the time of Dickens, we can slowly see that people are getting away from that. And then after World War One, it's just like, no, these are the people that are causing the wars. These are people that are doing the destructive things. These wars are a fucking racket, says Smedley Butler. Okay, not quite, but you get the idea. But no, they recognize that these are horribly destructive things, and we don't want any of these damn wars, so we just need to figure out how to peacefully coexist. How do you peacefully coexist? Well, first of all, we're not going to kill someone just because they look differently, they think differently, they believe differently, no matter what, no matter what. I mean, like, we're just going to have our nation that we have here, and we're not going to allow a, it to be destroyed. We're going to protect ourselves, but we're also not going to become the aggressors solely for the sake of conquering land, or solely for the sake of showing off, or solely for the sake of anything other than just protecting ourselves and our people and this, that, and the other. But, um, you know, it'd be nice if it would work in theory. I'd say, though, it's very difficult to actually get people to sort of all come on the same page with that because we are all opposed to this sort of thinking. I mean, like, we're all opposed to... I mean, so many people are opposed to that. They just, like, don't want to get over these barriers. And that's why there are these driving forces that separate people. Like, divisive rhetoric is so fashionable to so many politicians and... People like Henry Kissinger would have been very well aware of that. Kissinger was somebody who knew how to manipulate people. He knew how to manipulate people in large social groups, and not everything he said came to fruition. I mean, we don't have an African federation of, you know, 
Mali, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, those things aren't all one federation like the way he kind of predicted back in 58. And, you know, furthermore, it's like um, the global oligarchy expanded to things that included people other than him who were also involved in the process. Some people were kind of hypo hypothesizing out there that Henry Kissinger became the single most powerful person in the world based on his diplomatic connections. I mean, not talking the Secretary General of the UN, we're not talking about the President of the United States, we aren't talking about any a person other than Kissinger. He was the person in the world who held the single most amount of power because of his influence. Is that true? I don't know. I mean, I definitely know he works behind the scenes. There's a reason why people are protesting him at the Bilderberg Group, and there's a reason why people are, um, you know, so follow, so up to date on Kissinger and Associates. It's like they're really trying to just find out what is he all about, and he's definitely involved with the meetings and you know diplomatic decisions and he's definitely available and Walter Isaacson talks about this a lot about how you know it's like all all the money that he gets paid to go about these things but what people do need to also recognize is that um, Kissinger is a registered Democrat even though he was a Secretary of State for Richard Nixon he is a Republican but he's he's not about any party I really just sort of felt like He's just working for something larger, and probably at this point, you know, like over the later years of his life, it was probably just to expand his own wealth, power, and influence, and so the world didn't fall apart under, and he would get blamed for it. Maybe that was just the end goal, but what do you think?